Ladies and gentlemen, Acorn whistleblower, Miss Anita Monfrey. Thank you, and thank you for coming out. Can everyone hear me okay? First, I'd like to say good morning. I know it's a bright and early morning, but I'm glad you all made it out here today. And some of you may have heard the story, but I wanted to talk about a little bit about how I got here. Because as I tell people all the time, I never thought, if you had told me three to four years ago that I would be addressing conservatives across the country, I probably would have thought you were a little crazy. But here I am, so I want to tell you that story and how I got to where I am now. And uh, it starts a little bit back further than you think. Um, in December of 2001, I had gone to DC for the very first time. I was young and idealistic, and I was going to work with the American Bar Association. I came up there as an, in an unpaid intern, and I was working in Northwest DC. So I would have these wonderful lunches with lawyers from across the country, uh, $300 lunches, and then I would go home uh, to Southeast DC. I don't know how many of you guys have ever been to Southeast DC, but this is not what you see on the tour. This is like you go down Pennsylvania, go across the bridge, and it's totally different. So I got to see the extreme differences between rich and poor. And coming from Alabama, I never really had a lot of money, but urban poverty is totally different than it is in the South. We always seem to get by, but in the, um, up north, it was really extreme. So instead of focusing on international affairs with the ABA, after my internship, I figured that I wanted to help people in my own backyard. So I started looking around. And before the, um, the embezzlement scandal and everything else, ACORN seemed like a really great organization. You go to their website and it's all these pictures of people smiling and folks helping out in the community, picking up trash, putting stop signs, and they talked about giving people a voice for the very first time. So I thought, okay, this is something I want to do. I want to work hands-on for the community. So in October of 2005, I came back from Ala Birmingham, Alabama to DC for the very last time to work with, the, um, to work with ACORN National, which was ACORN Political Operations, and their sister organization, Project Vote. If you guys haven't heard of Project Vote, how many of you have? Good. That's ACORN's voter registration arm. It's also the organization that Obama worked for in the 90s. They are 501c3 nonprofit, and they were paying my salary, but a lot of the work that I was doing was coming from ACORN. So one of my first uh, tasks when I got there was to investigate the 2004 uh, voter registration fraud allegations. As you guys may remember, there was a huge, and I mean huge, anti-Bush sentiment on the left. Soros had spent millions of dollars on ad campaigns and websites and groups and everything else he could get out there to defeat Bush and get Kerry elected. So out of that came voter registration fraud allegations across the country, from Missouri to Florida to Georgia, Pennsylvania, everywhere. And it was my job to investigate these incidents and put them together in some type of form that the organization could use to defend itself. The only problem was, no matter where I looked, if it was, if it was in Missouri or Pennsylvania or wherever, it seemed that all the employees were doing the same thing. It was almost as if they had been trained that way. Yeah, right? <laughs> So I took this information to my supervisors, and they were very quick to tell me, no, it's just a couple of bad apples, one rogue employee that's the fraud in the organization. It's not us. And so I'm looking at the facts here and knowing that people are going to jail every election cycle. And ACORN did this on purpose. They didn't hire you and you to run voter registration drives. They would go out there and they'd find ex-crackheads and ex-junkies and con men and whoever. And then when the stuff, would, when everything would hit the fan, they'd go, see, this is a pattern of behavior. These people are bad people. They defrauded us. And those people would go to jail and ACORN would get off scot-free, free to do it another election cycle. But, and being there, you have, when you start off at ACORN, you come in, you're young and you're idealistic and you want to help people, but along the way, you have to start looking the other way at things. You see things that are going on and for the good of the movement, you ignore them. Or when they do things that are outright socialist, you don't use the term socialism, you just think what's fair is fair and what's right is right and we're trying to right the wrongs and it's all about the good of the people. So it's all about the collective good. It's not about the bad things you're doing because in the, the end, 
justifies the means. So that's where I was, and I was looking at all of these things, and I ignored it, even though I knew that those people were going to go to jail. The end goal was that ACORN registered 1.3 million people that cycle, and those people were on the rolls, and they were not being disenfranchised. And just to give you a little bit of background about the organization, when Wade Rathke started ACORN back in the 70s, he didn't start it to help people. One of the things that people don't realize is they think that ACORN was a great organization that got corrupt along the way. Unfortunately, its founders, they were always had socialist intentions. What happened is that they were working with the heirs of the world and they got tired of you know, their people getting uh, on the FBI list for blowing up buildings and stuff. So they decided that, the, decided that the best way to win was to assimilate into American society. So I tell people this, they went into the nonprofit world, they went into academia, which is why we have so many liberal professors, and in some cases they even went into the Republican Party so they could claim bipartisanship, which is how a lot of these groups get funded in years when Republicans have power. So there we were looking at people that had been there for almost 30 years running an organization, and they were at what uh, Zach Paulette liked to call, Zach Paulette was the executive director of ACORN and Project Vote simultaneously. In 2008, he said we had a once in a generation opportunity. And it wasn't to elect a black president, it was to pass <laughs> socialism, to fundamentally change the way we were doing things, and Barack Obama was just the conduit to do it. And to, and to get back on that, let's talk about where that, where that was. In 2007, I was sitting at a meeting of ACORN um, national staff from across the country in Little Rock, Arkansas. And Zach Paulette got up in front of the group and he told us that he had supervised, supervised Barack Obama in the 90s and that ACORN produces leaders. He was telling us right then and there that we, as community organizers, could be the next president of the United States. And then we be began to put together what I always like to call ACORN's socialist wish list. And I'm pretty sure you already know what was on that. Cap and trade, universal health care, forced unionism through card check, and a host of other environmental justice issues that would base, basically give the EPA just carte blanche. So we sat there and put that together, and they were going to pass that within the first few months of Obama's term. So I was, um, so when I got a call two weeks later from the Obama campaign to the Washington D office, Washington DC office, I was actually very excited. You know, this Obama campaign is calling, the, you know, calling Acorn. So I get out there and I type a little uh, email and I send it out to all my supervisors. And when I got back from that email, which I was told I should, probably shouldn't have sent, was a USB drive about this big. And on that USB drive was the second quarter Obama donor list from 2007. Now, if you guys remember, there was a big thing about this because Obama would not turn over his lower dollar donors. Anyone under $200, he refused to turn over to the FEC. But he gave this list to ACORN. And it was my job to go on there and contact the maxed out presidential donors and to tell them that even though they had maxed out, they could give to ACORN and ACORN would get Obama elected. Exactly, and this is when I started really having a problem because I wanted Obama to win, I wanted the Democrats to win, but we were cheating. And I thought if we were cheating, are we really winning? So in 2007, I contacted Brett Jacobson over at the Employment Policies Institute. He's now a writer at uh, BreitbartsBigGovernment.com, but this was my first time ever talking to anyone on the right. And I expected him to immediately, you know, pump me for information. And instead he said, I, this was in 2007, I had just had a daughter, and he told me, he's like, you know, going up against ACORN is very difficult from the inside. If you ever get away from the organization, give me a call and we will sit down and talk about this. Now, I was completely surprised because I'm thinking they're just going to start, oh, what do you know, and popping me for information. But it also gave me a little bit of confidence because I realized there were people that were willing to help me. So I decided to try to change the ACORN from the inside.